Jeremiah chapter 9, continuing on in the series of studies we've been in for the past, I don't know, maybe six months or so now, the attributes of God. We've come to the 16th study in this series, and we will read, as is our custom, Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. This is a fresh check to us this morning. Why are we here? What kind of ears are we listening with this morning? My prayer, and I will pray here momentarily, is that we desire to understand and know the Lord more and more. The most important thing for every man ever born of a woman is a true and saving knowledge of God. And that is what we are trying to promote in these studies. So let's pray, and then we'll dig into the topic of God's grace. Father in heaven, you are great. You are far greater than our highest thought. Lord, we want to thank high thoughts of you. So come and visit us with tender mercies and with grace that enables us to hear and understand and know you more. Visit us with grace that helps us to see Christ more clearly and to hold him more dearly. Father, come and visit us with your presence this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before we even begin to dig into the topic of God's grace, I felt there are some important and foundational truths that need to be understood first, some groundwork that needs to be laid before we can even properly understand grace. This is kind of unique. This is not typical. Normally, we just dig right in to the attribute at hand, but this morning it'll be a little different. For grace to be appreciated and seen for the gift that it is, one must first embrace several core truths. And I want to look at those for you. I envisioned it in my mind as being four key pillars that provide the foundation for the monument of grace. And brethren, let me tell you, grace is a monument in the New Testament. Grace thrives in the New Testament. So four key pillars that provide a foundation this morning before we even discuss the topic of grace. Pillar number one, people are bad. That's pillar number one. Yes, that's very foundational, isn't it? People are bad. I remember hearing from the folks in the church plant in Portland the one time that Timothy Conway was there from the San Antonio church. It happened to be a nursing home ministry Sunday. They do that every other Sunday, and they've been consistently doing that for two years now. And so the families there asked Brother Tim if he would share with the elderly ones. You know, we normally take five or ten minutes maybe and share a brief exhortation, a, a miniature sermon. Tim was glad to do that. And he got up and took about 90 seconds. And he said, all of you are bad. This is elderly people in a nursing home. But they needed to hear that fundamental truth. People are bad. That's right. You and me. We're bad. We're corrupted. We're depraved from the start. We can make all sorts of enormous technological advances. We can put people on the moon. But we are bad to the core. If anything, all of our achievements 
and have only further served to corrupt the heart of men. Making him think that he really is something. Something other than what he truly is. A creature of dust, a sinner through and through. Proud humanity wants to make a light of its sin and magnify its victories. All in an effort to suppress thoughts of moral depravity that abide in the heart that is inherent in each and every one of us. We drown out our conscience with so many dangerous vices. We drown out our thoughts with so many deceitful voices. This is what men do from birth. People are bad. In doing so, in suppressing the truth that God has clearly revealed, in suppressing it in unrighteousness, one can grow to begin to think themselves not all that bad. One can grow to even believe themselves to be a good person. Yes, gambling and alcoholism and a lustful heart aside. This is the deceitfulness of sin that is present not just in the 21st century, but present in every man that has been born of a woman since the fall of Adam and Eve. The thought of living life before the eyes of a holy God in heaven never crosses their minds until they're arrested by something. So we're evil from the womb. God's image stamped upon us is defaced. We are fallen, slaves to sin. People are bad. That's pillar number one. Before we even get to the topic of God's grace. People are bad. Number two, pillar number two, in addition to that, God has revealed himself to us all, particularly the reality that God is just and he will punish sin. We looked at Romans 2 verse 5 a couple of weeks ago when we were studying God's wrath. But also we see in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Revealed from heaven. Not hidden, not concealed, but revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So pillar number two, God is just and will punish all evil. Unrighteous men can suppress this truth till they're blue in the face, but they can never change this truth. It's been revealed from heaven. God's justice is perfect. It always prevails. The mindset of the world is to think that God is somehow like us. And we wonder why the world has no appreciation for God's grace. They don't view God as one who is holy and righteous and will punish sin. But it's been revealed from heaven. The world thinks God owes them something. Well, in a sense, he does. Righteous wrath and punishment. Men think of God as the kind of teacher that moves the failing student along because he can throw a football. Or they think God to be the kind of judge that can be paid off at some point before the court hearing and get a favorable judgment. But God is not like that kind of teacher. He's not like that kind of judge. He's holy and righteous and true. The idea of wrath and justice in God is viewed as old school. That's entirely medieval. Something so petty and so trivial. Are you kidding me? We're not so barbaric today. This is the 21st century. Judgment, please. And God laughs in the heavens. And he will judge all men. It's been clearly revealed from heaven. According to Romans 1. And all the while, in reality, man's sin, the bad ones, pillar number one, their sin is mounting. And the fire of God's wrath is growing increasingly hot. And yet the foolish creatures think themselves swell. 
It'll all pan out in the end. Men aren't swell. They weren't swell in the 21st century. They aren't swell in the 21st century, nor any century prior. God is just. Pillar number two. And he will punish sin. Pillar number three. Man can never please God. People are bad. God is just. And man can never please God. Again, these are foundational things we need to address before we even begin to speak of God's grace. If we skip over these details, grace is meaningless. Not only when we're talking about not being able to please God, not only are men powerless to pull the pleasing God switch, but we are blind and we couldn't even find it if we tried to. That's how hopeless our estate is. Men are born deceived. They think that somehow, some way, they can please God. From birth, all man buys into the little engine that could theology. And we see that cute little locomotive plodding up the hill saying, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. When what men need to embrace is biblical doctrine. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8. Even Nemo's father, for those that have seen Finding Nemo, this was Marlin, the bigger little cute fish. He says to his son, you think you can do these things, but you can't, Nemo. He had better theology than many professing Christians in our nation today. Paul is clear when he says, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Romans 3.20 Try and try as men so often do, and they aren't one inch closer to a single drop of righteousness. Man cannot please God. This is the third pillar. It reminds me of a time when Amber and the girls and I were on a beach vacation together. This was probably close to a decade ago. And the girls were obviously quite a bit younger. They were not very strong. And we decided on a windy day to do some kayaking. Starting from the beach and heading out into the vast blue ocean. I was the only one paddling and boy did I paddle that day. And paddle. And paddle and paddle some more. And after what seemed like ages... In reality, it was probably 12 to 15 minutes. We were no further than about 50 yards off that shore. The waves kept beating on that kayak. We'd go forward 10 feet, only to go backward 20 feet. And we just kept trying. And then finally threw in the proverbial towel. In this sense, the paddle. And we went back to the shore. I thought I could make it past those breaker waves on that windy day with just enough effort. But it was all in vain. Fun, wet, but all in vain. Man cannot please God. Much in the same way, try and try, though they may. Think of the stanza of Rock of Ages. Not the labor of my hands could fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite? No. Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Man cannot reconcile himself to God. It simply cannot be done. No A for effort. It's an F. For effort. Man can never please God. Pillar number four. The fourth and final pillar. That we need to see before we can see grace for what it is. God is totally free. God is totally free. Now, now this is a truth we've discussed weeks past. When we looked at God's sovereignty. When we saw his power. But it remains the same. God is totally free. 
He is sovereign. He is not obliged to do any kind thing to any part of his creation. Obliged and God, they just don't go together. God is not obliged to do sinners a single good thing. The French atheist Voltaire is quoted as saying, God will forgive. That's just his job. Well, no, it isn't. It's his work. It's his gracious work. But God has no boss and he receives no pay. It is only his gracious work to pardon a single sinner. He does this joyfully and with great delight. But it's not his job. He doesn't owe an employer anything. He doesn't have an employer. Romans 9, 16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. He's not bound to be merciful or gracious. He was not bound to save a wretch like me. And he isn't the least dependent on humanity for anything. Because he needs nothing from us, he's not obligated to do anything for us. God is completely free. If we're honest with the Bible and ourselves, the only thing God clearly owes us is justice. That we deserve. A justice that would end in every one of us being in torment forever and ever. There, that's what we're owed by God. So God and obligation don't mesh. Not when it comes to sinful, unrepentant creatures. J.I. Packer said, only when it is seen that what decides each individual's destiny is whether or not God resolves to save him from his sins, and that this is a decision which God need not make in any single case, can one begin to grasp the view of grace? Did y'all hear that? Can you even understand what I'm saying? <laughs> I'll read it again. <clears throat> Water is not helping. Only when it is seen that what decides each individual's destiny is whether or not God resolves to save him from his sins. And that this is a decision which God need not make in any single case. Can one begin to grasp the biblical view of grace? That's very foundational. Did God owe you anything? Only when we can answer with a full and honest heart, no, brother, all he owed me was justice. Only then can we begin to understand the grace of God. God is absolutely 100% free to do what he pleases with men. So the pillars are now erected. Four foundational pillars. It's time for the featured attraction. Let's, let's begin now to... Dig into this doctrine of God's grace, this attribute, the 16th in our series. Let's take a look together at the monument, the beautiful, glorious, eternal monument of God's grace. Let's understand it. Let's marvel at its features. Let's begin with the definition of grace. And then we'll end with several features of grace. Defined, this is... A working definition, certainly not comprehensive or perfect. God's grace is His free communication of kindness to wrath-deserving recipients, those who have no claim to it whatsoever. God's grace is His free communication of kindness to wrath-deserving recipients, those who have no claim to it whatsoever. J.I. Packer defined it saying, It is God showing goodness to persons who deserve only severity. 
and had no reason to expect anything but severity. Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology defines it as the unmerited goodness or love of God to those who have forfeited it and are by nature under a sentence of condemnation. Brethren, we need to walk away with this. It is God's grace that causes him to pity the wretched, to pardon the guilty, to receive the castaways, and to adopt sinning rebels. It's God's grace. All the good that God does towards sinful creatures is motivated by grace. A.W. Pink says it is completely, God's grace, is completely unmerited and unsought. It is altogether unattracted by anything in or from or by the objects upon which it is bestowed. Grace can neither be bought, earned, nor won by the creature. If it could be, it would cease to be grace. Romans 11, verse 6, Paul understood this well. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Grace and works simply don't mix, much like oil and water. A little bit of works pollutes the whole of grace. The Apostle Paul uses a helpful analogy to help us wrap our minds around this concept in Romans 4 when he's proving the point that salvation by grace is a gift, a gift from God. We don't work for it. We don't earn it in any way. If a man goes to work next week, puts in his 40 hours, earns $10 an hour, then he deserves on Friday a $400 paycheck, doesn't he? He earned it through his labors. The Apostle Paul would say it is his due. Yet salvation is all of grace. Work doesn't even enter into the equation. It's a gift of grace from the God of all grace. 1 Peter 5.10 so when we're trying to wrap our minds around God's grace, we need to remove works from the equation. And that is easier said than done. Probably every Christian here could say, Amen, I feel that. But we want to magnify grace. We want to live in light of the reality of grace that says it's not based on your performance. It's based on a generous God that lavishes grace upon creatures. Well, I think it's helpful when we're talking about grace to make a distinction. It will help us in our hermeneutic as we approach Scripture and read through Scripture to see that there is something like a common grace. And I know I mentioned this briefly last Sunday as well when we talked about God's love. But there is a common grace that we see in the scriptures as well as a saving grace. And we do need to make the distinction between them. They are radically different on points. Common grace encompasses God's benevolent acts towards all of mankind. You remember he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Paul could say to the pagan people that God has blessed you with abundant rains and fruitful seasons and good days. This is common grace. The fact that we're not murdering each other this morning and that God is restraining sin in the earth. This is common grace. If you just view common grace as rain and seasons and the restraint of evil then I think you've made real progress in how you'll read certain passages in the Bible. 
Common grace, though, it, in reality, isn't a very good name. Right? Is anything common about what God does? Right? When we're talking about kindness that comes down from our Father above through the one mediator, Jesus Christ, to sinful humanity, is there anything common about that? But theologians call it common grace, really to distinguish the radical differences between it and electing grace or saving grace. And on that note, I want to say, when we're talking about grace, we cannot not talk about the mediator, the one that mediates grace to humanity. And whether that is common grace or whether that is saving grace, it is one man, the one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the one who was full of grace and truth, according to John 1, and he is the sole mediator of grace from God to man. It comes through and by Jesus Christ. This communication of grace to humanity, this is what Paul refers to in Romans 2 verse 4 as the riches of of kindness and forbearance and patience. That general benevolence to all mankind, this is what theologians call common grace. Well, then there is God's saving grace or distinguishing grace or electing grace. This is the sovereign grace of God exercised towards those whom God determined to redeem before the foundation of the world. This is a special, particular grace. Ephesians 1 verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. We could read Ephesians 1, we could read Ephesians 2, and grace is flowing through all of those verses there. And the grace of God is not a doctrine confined to the New Testament alone. We see that there is a God of grace, a gracious God, according to Jonah 4.2. And He is operating and hovering around the pages of the Old Testament Think of Exodus 33, 19. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. To speak of free, electing, saving, distinguishing grace. We have to emphasize God's sovereignty, His freedom in it all. God is capable God is fully free to save one person and pass over another person. No one can put a single demand on God to be gracious to even a single sinner. Again, as A.W. Pink says, nowhere, nowhere does the glory of God's free and sovereign grace shine more conspicuously than in the unworthiness and unlikeliness of its objects. He's free, brethren. He's free, or grace is not grace. There's a story of an elderly Native American chief. And after living many years in darkness and sin, he was led to Christ by a missionary. Friends of his asked him to explain the change, the transformation that had taken place in his life. And reaching down, he picked up a little worm and he placed it on a pile of leaves. And then touching a match to the leaves, he set them aflame and watched them begin to smolder and then fully ignite. And as the flames worked their way up, to the center of that pile of leaves where the worm lay, the old chief suddenly plunged his hand into the center of those leaves 
and snatched out the worm. Holding the worm gently in his hand, he gave testimony to God's grace. And he said, me, worm. That's why God's grace is so glorious. He saved sinners like you and me. It is only by God's saving grace that those who once served corrupt and defiled, pur defiled purposes in the earth, those who corrupted themselves and corrupted others, it is only by God's grace that they are ever transformed into those that cause God, His angels, and His saints to rejoice with exceeding joy. The truth is, if grace doesn't save us, we can never be saved. Yes, wrath-deserving idolaters. These are the objects of God's grace. And God's kindness has showed them. And this is great grace. Great God of wonders, all thy ways display the attributes divine. But countless acts of pardoning grace beyond thine other wonders shine. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich, so free? This is the glorious God of grace. That was a hymn, a stanza of a hymn written by Samuel Davies, the once president of Princeton. Let's consider together now the features Certain key features, three of them in all, features of God's grace. We're gazing upon that beautiful monument supported by those four essential pillars. And these are features that are full of meaning. Features that we need to grasp as believers and hold on to for our dear lives. Features that we need to guard with our very lives. Features that we need to proclaim to sinners in need of grace. The features of grace, three of them. One, grace is free. Now one of the four foundational pillars was that God was free. And grace is an attribute of God, therefore grace must be free. But there's a little bit of a different connotation here, and I want us to all latch on to it, latch on to it well. This is a grace that is bought by sinners without money and without price. Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. This by no means, when we say that grace is free, is meant to diminish the value of grace. You can't diminish anything about God anyways. Why try? Someone might say, well, brother, if you're saying that grace is free, then it must be cheap. No, that's not a logical conclusion. You can't prove that. So we say as believers, having experienced the grace of God in Jesus Christ, no, no, it isn't cheap. No. It is free because it is priceless. You could combine all the riches of the world and still not be able to afford a single drop of grace if it could be measured that way. God's grace is free. And there's no fine print attached. There's no devil in the details. I remember the old Columbia House free movie offers. I was a young man, maybe a young teenager at the time. I think my mother fell into that trap at one point or another. Leslie, you're smiling. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. 
This was a mail order offer where you'd get this well-designed catalog with numerous choices of VHS movies. The latest and greatest movies of the day, the blockbuster hits. Yes, this was pre-DVD era. Mary, Charity... You could select a certain number of movies for free, or at one point they would do them for a penny a piece. And they would send them to you. You'd think, and this is amazing, as long as you didn't read the fine print. If you didn't read it, you were amazed, and these movies show up in your mailbox a week or two later. You open the packages and you think you just stumbled onto something amazing. The sinful mind begins to think, how can I abuse this and get a bunch more free movies? Then after shipping those movies out to your home, maybe 30 days or so later, a little card would show up in the mailbox. And they would say that they were going to send you more movies. If you didn't check the box saying, no thank you. And mail that card back to them in the right amount of time. They would send you more movies. And this time they weren't so free. And with those movies would be attached a bill. And these movies were relatively overpriced. To compensate for the free movies that you received previously. Brethren, God's grace is gimmick free. It is altogether free, no strings attached. You can't buy it, you couldn't afford it, but you can receive it for free. This is what Romans 5.15 is saying, that grace is the free gift of God. Salvation by grace is an extraordinary gift God gives to sinners. We must really embrace this. Christians and unbelievers alike need to embrace this. Yes, even you and I can struggle with the realization that grace is entirely free. Even you and I can struggle. There is this hard to kill tendency in mankind to want to pay something or do something to merit God's grace. It's a ridiculous notion, I get it, but we have all been guilty of it at one time or another or 10 times or 10,000 times. Maybe some of us are still struggling with it to this day. Here's a bad analogy, but I'm going to share it anyways because all analogies really break down when we talk about The attributes of God, so this one's bound to fall short, but I think you'll get the picture. A man goes to New York City for a weekend adventure, and one of the museum stops that he wants to make along the way is the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Met. As he walks through the door of the museum, the man is immediately stopped by security officers. He's asked to step aside into a private room. And there in that room is the president of the corporation that owns the Met. He's seated at a table with a big grin on his face and a single page document before him. And he tells the man that he is the one billionth visitor to the Met. On a side note, I don't think there have been one billion visitors to the Met. But they do have multiplied millions of visitors every year. I think last year, some 60-something million people. And the president of the corporation proceeds to tell the man that because he's the one billionth visitor, he is being granted ownership of the museum. This had long ago been in the plans, apparently, when the first museum was built by the original benefactors. And all this man had to do was sign the document and own not just one piece of art, but all two million pieces of art on display there. The real estate, everything. Sir, just sign. And it's all yours. 
to give you some conception of the value of the Met, no man could probably say. But in a single year, they might spend $40 million on the acquisition of new art. And they've been spending that kind of money for a whole lot of years. It's valuable. Billions, we could say. The offer overwhelms the man. He was just coming to visit. He can't believe it. Instinctively, he pulls out his wallet. It's empty. Puts back the wallet into his back pocket, reaches into his front pocket. Ah, there's some coins. He pulls out the coins. He counts them in his palm. 57 cents. He offers it to the president. 57 cents. To the Met president. Oh, we could go on and carry out the stupid illustration. Maybe the Met president laughs. Maybe he slaps the man's hand away and the coins fly against the wall. Maybe the president just stares in disbelief. Whatever the case, I think you get the point. God's grace is infinitely more valuable than the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we're going to offer God 57 cents? Grace is free. It's truly free. Yet men do the silliest things in a futile attempt to buy God's grace. They go to church. They tithe. They take communion. They pray. They fix the flat tire of an elderly woman stuck on the side of a rural road. They bring groceries to a needy neighbor. They send $10 to the Red Cross for the relief fund for the latest monsoon, tornado, or earthquake. Ten million things have been tried by an idolatrous humanity, and every one of them has failed. Every one of them miserably failed. Good little boys and good little girls think to themselves, surely God will accept a cute little boy, little girl like me. Good mothers and good fathers, they think to themselves, I've sacrificed so much for my children, surely God will receive me. But all of this is vanity. All of it is meaningless in the sense of ever meriting the least bit of God's grace. God owes men nothing and yet freely offers in His Son to give men everything in Him. Salvation and all that follows, all that flows from it. Grace is free. Secondly, grace is great. The truth we must cling to here is that the vilest of sinners can know God's grace and be instantly and forever cleansed. Romans 5.20, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound in the King James Version, the ESV, but where sin increased, grace did much more abound. A.W. Tozer commenting on this text, he says to abound in sin, that is the worst, and yet the most we can or could do. The word abound defines the limit of our finite abilities, and although we feel our iniquities, Rise over us like a mountain. The mountain, nevertheless, has definable boundaries. It is so large and so high and so heavy. It weighs only a certain amount and no more. But who shall define the limitless grace of God? It's much more plunges our thoughts into infinitude and confounds them there. 
All thanks be to God for grace abounding. God's grace is great. Brethren, grace. Grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. There isn't a single sinner God can't save. The worst of them that has ever been or ever will be, God's grace can topple with little effort. Why? Because grace is greater. The hardest of human hearts, even those like stones, can be subdued by God's invisible hand with ease. He subdued my heart 21 years ago. King Manasseh in 2 Chronicles 33, it seems like he took all the evil instructions of his predecessors. Predecessors in the northern kingdom like Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Predecessors that were evil and walked in ungodly ways in the southern kingdom. Manasseh said, I'm going to follow that and that and that and that. I'm even going to put my sons in the fire and burn them. That was King Manasseh and all his evil. And yet in 2 Chronicles 33, he cries out to God in his affliction and imprisonment. And we read that God heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. God's grace. In the New Testament, we think of Saul of Tarsus and all of his wickedness and all of his persecutions, lording his authority over gracious Christians and even persecuting them all the way to death. Papers in hand, Paul ravages the early church. And yet, According to Paul's own testimony in Galatians 1, verse 15, God called me by His grace. God was pleased to reveal Jesus Christ to me. In due time, I turned from those wicked ways. It was all of grace, the Apostle Paul says. John Newton, in all of his depravity, Young, lustful, idolatrous, works his way up in positions of authority to the captain of a slave ship. Sells himself into a load of debt, essentially becoming a slave himself to a ruthless master who's going to get him out of this predicament. Evil at heart through and through. And yet, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Death row inmates, prostitutes, Pharisees, prominent members of false religions, even Syrian Islamic terrorists can be subdued by the invisible and gracious hand of God. It is nothing for him. To save any man, the most vile among the human race. And why? Because God's grace is greater. It conquers, it triumphs. When God has put his mark on a man, he will have him. Whatever it takes. There is no stopping a gracious God who relentlessly pursues his elect. Grace is great. And third and final, it's grace alone. This is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. This is the season to celebrate the fact that we stand on the shoulders of giants, men that have come before us, the Zwinglies of the world, the Bucers of the world, the Luthers of the world, the Calvins of the world. And from the Reformation was birthed those five solas, one of which is sola gratia, Latin, for grace alone. And it's grace alone, brethren, and so shall it be until the day when King Jesus returns a second time without sin 
unto salvation. And He makes all things right. It'll be grace alone until the new heavens and the new earth are ours. Romans 3.24 Paul says, And are justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. By His grace. As a gift. And so shall it ever be. Grace alone. Works. Not in the equation. Galatians 2.16 says as much. Titus 3.5 says it even more clearly. Paul. His whole thrust of Romans 4. Is that salvation is by faith. And not. By works of righteousness. Not the labors of my hands. Could ever fulfill God's demands. It's grace alone. And it's grace to the end. Come thou fount of every blessing. I'll read one half of a stanza. And I'll pray and we'll have some time for Q&A. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. We know the rest. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Well, brethren, it's grace. It's grace. God's grace. Father, we... We stand in awe of your great grace. Words fail. The best of presentations, the most thorough of sermons, Lord, they all fail. They fail to properly recognize and properly magnify your great grace. They just fail. And Lord, we fail. We fail to daily live in light of the reality of your grace that is constantly being communicated to us as your people. We fall into traps. We fall into wrong thinking. God, deliver us. Show mercy. I pray that today, Lord, you would birth in each of us a far greater appreciation a far greater hunger, a far greater glory in the God of grace. Father, you are great and greatly to be praised. Help us in these ways, we pray. Amen.